I want to focus your attention this morning on Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26, I'm going to read verses 30 through 35, and then I'm going to skip down to verse 69 and read verse 69 to 75. So Matthew chapter 26, beginning in verse 30. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered him, though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, truly, I tell you, Peter, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. Skipping down to verse 69. Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard and a servant girl came up to him and said, you also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you mean. And when he went out to the entrance, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied it with an oath, I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you too are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. This is part eight in a series that I've entitled Irreligious. We've been spending the last seven weeks going through different episodes in the Gospels, different stories in the Gospels, parables in the Gospels, uh, comparing and contrasting religion with Christianity. And we've seen over and over through these various stories how religion and Christianity are two very, very different things. That religion is primarily about us and what we do, and Christianity is primarily about God and what he's done. Religion, in fact, and I've said this week after week, is actually not about God at all. Typically, when we hear the word religion, we think that it's about God, but religion is not about God at all. It's about me. It's about my behavior, my obedience, my faithfulness, my devotion, my improvement, my commitment, and so on and so forth. In other words, the focus of religion is on how, on how I can make things right between God and me. That's the focus of religion. How I can make things right between God and me. The focus of Christianity, on the other hand, is on how God made things right between God and me. Okay, two very, very different things. This is why I've said, and I don't mean to sound overly critical or overly cynical, But it's just a fact, it's true, um, that most churches are more religious than Christian. They don't realize it. They don't realize that they are. But most churches are more religious than Christian because most churches spend their time telling me how to live for God, how to get close to God, how to love God, and so on and so forth. None of those things are bad in and of themselves. But if you go to church, there's a better chance you will hear a sermon on the five ways you can get close to God than there is a sermon on the one way that God has come close to you in the person of Jesus, okay? Um, I was talking to a guy who grew up in church about six months ago, and he said this to me. He said, "I, I grew up going to church, and I heard way more sermons about how I should live than I did about Jesus. I think that sums it up. These it's not that they are intentionally doing the wrong thing. They don't, they don't know any different. Uh, they've been taught, many of us have been taught to believe that what passes as Christianity is really just religion. Um, it's about me and what I must do. Rich Mullins, who was a, a musician, died a number of years ago in a car accident, said this. I've attended church regularly since I was less than a week old. I've listened to sermons about virtue, and I've listened to sermons against vice. I've heard sermons about money, 
time management, marriage, and goal setting. I've listened to thousands of sermons, but I could count on one hand the number of sermons I've heard about Jesus. Sermon after sermon, book after book is a practical lesson on how to live a better life, how to have healthier relationships, how to stop bad habits, how to reach your potential, and so on and so forth. It's all about personal improvement. And while some of that advice may be helpful, that's not Christianity. The goal of Christianity is not to give you good advice or good techniques on how to live a better life. And that strikes us as strange because for many of us, that's what we've always assumed it is because that's what we've heard. Um, the goal of Christianity actually is not to deliver good advice or good techniques on how to live a better life. The goal of Christianity is to deliver good news. The goal of Christianity is to give you Jesus' blood, Jesus' righteousness, Jesus' forgiveness. It's not to deliver you a divine self-help plan so that you can have your best life now. That's not Christianity, okay? Christianity exists to deliver Jesus to sinners, to give us his forgiveness, his love, his righteousness, his blood. In other words, okay, listen carefully. The message of Christianity is not to copy every good move that Jesus made, okay? Rather, the message of Christianity is Jesus dying for every bad move we make, okay? There's, now, that's a big difference between those two things. And if you grew up in church or spent time in Christian circles like I did growing up, um, then you, you know this was kind of the regular diet that we received. You know, I can remember growing up in Christian schools, youth groups, Sunday school, whatever, and most of the lessons I heard were all about me and my life and how to live a better life for God. Uh, there was a huge identification of sins to avoid and things to pursue and all of that stuff. And while all of that may have been helpful in some way, I didn't hear a whole lot about the fact that Jesus died for bad people because bad people are all that there are. I didn't hear things like, because Jesus succeeded for you, you're free to fail without facing the rejection of God. I didn't hear things like uh, we are clothed in an irremovable suit of righteousness because of what Jesus has done. I didn't hear things like um, God's love for you and God's disposition towards you is not dependent on you. It's ultimately dependent on what Jesus has done for you. Because I grew up assuming that what I did or what I failed to do radically altered the way God saw me, the way God viewed me, the way God felt about me. So if I was being good, I thought God felt good about me on that day. And if I was being bad, then God felt bad about me on that day. But how God felt about me was ultimately dependent on me, what I do, what I don't do. Uh, and so you can only imagine uh, that when it first dawned on me by actually reading the Bible... That God's love for me is dependent on what Jesus has done for me. That there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that nothing can separate us from God's love because God's love is not dependent on what I do or don't do. Uh, it was like I became a Christian all over again. It was literally like I became a Christian all over again. I was finally hearing good news for what it actually was. Um, so you could say it this way, the focus of religion is on the amount of love I have for God. The focus of Christianity is on the amount of love God has for me, okay? Now, here's the irony, because we might say, well, isn't it important that we love God? Of course, okay? Obviously, we love him because he first loved us, First John tells us. The question is, how does love for God happen in our hearts? Does love for God happen in our hearts by someone telling us to love God? Or does love for God happen in our hearts because God loves us? That's how it happens. We don't fall in love with people who look at us and say, love me better. We fall in love with people who look at us at our worst and simply say, I love you. 
Well, that's what God has done in the person of Jesus. At our worst, he looks at us and says, I love you. And it's that unconditional, no strings attached love for us that creates love in us for him. So it's not a matter of whether it's important to love God. It's how does love for God actually happen? It doesn't happen by being given a list of rules and regulations and a series of steps up a ladder that we must climb. That's not how it happens. Um, Even when Jesus says, you need to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Nowhere in that passage does Jesus even insinuate that the simple issuing of that command is what creates the love that is demanded. It's God's love for us that creates love in us. Um, So again, let me say it this way. The message of Christianity is not copy every good move Jesus made. That's not. Good luck with that, by the way, okay? If that's your goal, have fun with that one. Get back to me in a week and let me know how you're doing with that, okay? Um, That's not the message of Christianity. The message of Christianity is not be like Jesus, okay? The message of Christianity is that Jesus became like us and reconciled us to God. That's the message of Christianity. Um, The message of Christianity is not be good enough to bridge the gap between you and God. Impossible. The message of Christianity is that God was good enough to bridge the gap between us and him in the person of Jesus. Um, So while the focus of religion is on the amount of love I have for God, the focus of Christianity is on the amount of love God has for me. And when that becomes the focus, guess what happens? Love for God develops in our hearts. Well, we see that contrast explicitly here in this story, the contrast between religion and Christianity, between um, our love for God and God's love for us. Peter was religious to the core, and the reason I say that is because as we saw in what I just read, his confidence was in his love for Jesus. That's where his confidence was in. My love for Jesus will carry the day. I will never deny you. They may deny you, not me. My love for you is stronger than their love for you, and that's what will see me through. Um, But Jesus shows him that our love for him will always fall short. God's love for us succeeds. Our love for him fails perpetually. It is God's unfailing love for us that keeps us close to God, not our failing love for him, okay? Um, now, it's easy to put Peter in a box. I've done it. You know, we put Peter in a box. He's, we look at him. He, we laugh at him in many episodes throughout the Gospels. He had a well-earned reputation for talking more than he listened, okay? He was always talking, 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 It's almost like Jesus would say something and then Peter would respond and Jesus would say things like, get behind me, Satan, okay? I mean, that's the kind of stuff that would come out of Peter's mouth. I think he probably meant well, but he was just always talking before he listened. He was always acting before he thought, always. You know, at the Last Supper when Jesus comes around to wash his disciples' feet and Peter's like, not me. Never will I allow you to wash my feet. I should be washing your feet. And Jesus responds and says, uh, you know, Peter very piously said that. And then Jesus responds and says, listen, it's not just your feet that need to be washed. Uh, and And then Peter said, well, if that's the case, Lord, then wash all of me. Okay. Like, okay, settle down, you know. I mean, his piety was on full display. Like, I am the holy one in the room. I will never bail on you. I will, I mean, that's kind of the way he was. And so we read story after story like that about this guy. And we we laugh, understandably so. We're like, what an idiot, you know? I mean, he's just always sticking his foot in his mouth. He's just always, he's always showcasing his piety. Um, But I think we're a lot more like him than we tend to think believe it or not. Peter never had a problem voicing his devotion to Jesus. He loved Jesus. He wasn't shy about making that known. Jesus called Peter, a fisherman, to follow him. 
And then Jesus invested three years of his life in Peter. I mean, they were good friends. You know, Jesus had 12 disciples, and then there were three that were part of his really inner, inner circle. Well, Peter was one of those three. I mean, they were close. They were, they were good friends. Peter, because of his friendship with Jesus, was confident in his commitment to Jesus. He was proud of his love for Jesus. He was convinced that his devotion to Jesus would carry the day. I'm confident that my steadfast love for you, O oh God, will never fail. Verse 30 in Matthew 26 says, seems almost like a throwaway line. When they had sung a hymn. Now, why does Matthew mention that they sang a hymn? It doesn't seem terribly relevant to the story. Well, Bible scholars are certain that they sang Psalm 136. And what's interesting about Psalm 136 is that it's 26 verses long and 26 times, 26 times in 26 verses, it says, his steadfast love endures forever. His steadfast love endures forever. Before he goes to the cross, Jesus wants to drive home to all of his disciples by singing this song, by singing this hymn. 26 times pointing to the steadfast love of God, which endures forever. He wanted them to know, wanted them to know that it's his love for them, not their love for him, which endures forever. That's what he wanted them to know. He wanted to pound that into them. Because then in verse 31, uh, Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me for this, at, on this night. All. All. You're all going to, none of your love, you, Peter, your love, nobody's love in this room is going to carry the day. Mine will. You guys are all going to bail. And of course, Peter, it says later on that all of them sort of nodded their head in agreement with Peter, but Peter was the spokesman. They may fall away, not me. You're wrong, Jesus. I mean, you've never been wrong before, but now you are. Okay, I've listened to you for three years. And I've never heard you say anything wrong except tonight. You're wrong. That ain't going to happen. I won't fall away. Peter's like, no way. There's no way. Though they all fall away, I will never fall away. And then when Jesus tells Peter that before the night is over, he will deny him three times, Peter responds, not me. And then again, this massive overstatement, even if I have to die with you, I will. You know, he's so bombastic in his confidence that his love for Jesus will carry the day. Sounds like a lot of us. We think that our devotion to God is what matters most. It's what will drive us. It will, it's what will sustain us. It's what will keep us on the right track and so on and so forth. If I just love God well, my life will go smoothly. If I just do all the right things and show my steadfastness and my strength, everything will go just fine. Life will be okay. I mean, I've heard it my whole life, sermons and songs that push our love for God, our work for God, our performance for God, our obedience to God. I think I told you this a number of weeks ago, but at my former church, um, we sang the old hymn in a very big contemporary way one Sunday, but the old hymn, I Surrender All, familiar with it? And after it was over, I went to my uh, worship leader, uh, who was a dear friend of mine, and I said, I don't think we can sing that hymn anymore. And he said, you know, I was just thinking the same thing. I don't think we can in good conscience. I mean, at what point in my life can I say with honesty and integrity that I have surrendered all? At best, I surrender some. On my best spiritual day, all I've surrendered is some. And even if I surrender some, that portion of my surrender doesn't do anything to make me right with God. Nothing. Nothing. Okay, it's like the story I told you guys. I think it was you guys. Maybe it was, I don't remember. 
Stacy and I do this live stream on Tuesday night, and then we do Wednesday night, and then I'm here on Sunday. So I get confused which group I say these things to. So if I repeat myself, please forgive me. Plus, I'm getting a little aged. Uh, but um, that story that Max Lucado tells in one of his books about jumping to the moon, have I told you guys that story? He says, you know, we are so judgmental. And what's interesting is that if God had said, listen, forget about keeping the law. Don't, don't worry about that stuff. Don't worry about keeping the law in order to get to heaven. All you have to do is jump to the moon. That's all you got to do. Simple task. Just jump to the moon and you'll be saved. And he said, you know, some people jump six feet. Some people who are incredibly athletic might even jump like eight or nine feet. Okay. And then they look back and look down on the people that only jump six inches. Well, what's the difference between nine feet and six inches when you have 120,000 miles to go, okay? So even if we surrender some, we are light years away from what God requires, okay? So I looked at my worship guy, and I said, I don't think we can, I don't think we can sing that anymore. He said, I have a solution. So he changed the words from I surrender all to Christ surrendered all. Now that I can sing. So, I, I mean, I wish, I, I've said this before, but I wish I could say I surrender all to Jesus. I can't. Neither can you. What I can say is that Jesus surrendered all for me. That's the gospel, okay? I, I wish I could say I've kept all my promises to God. I can't. Neither can you. What I can say is that God has kept all of his promises to me, Okay? That's, that's the gospel. Well, back to the story. So what happens next? Okay. Well, Peter, who had a tremendous amount of confidence in his love for Jesus, fails miserably. Just like Jesus said, Peter denied him three times. He denied even knowing him. First, he denies that he was with Jesus in verse 69 and 70. I wasn't even with him. Then he ramps it up a bit, and he denies that he even knows Jesus, verse 72, and then he ramps it up even more. He curses and swears that he doesn't know him. He takes an oath that he doesn't know Jesus. Um, Luke 22, verse 61 adds in this story, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Um, and in absolute brokenness, Peter realizes the weakness of his love for Jesus. It dawns on him. My love for Jesus cannot, will not, and did not carry the day. Um, his love melted as soon as the heat got turned up. His love faded in the face of a threat to his well-being, just like ours does. Well, whose love endures forever? Not Peter's. Not ours. Putting any confidence in our love for God to carry the day is religious to the core. It is, it is the, the instinct of religion to believe that my love for God will get me through. I've said this before. I am standing before you and alive today, not because in my darkest and worst moments I held on to God. I am standing before you and alive today because in my darkest moments, in my worst moments, God never let go of me. That is it, okay? Well, I'm not here because of my willpower. And there are well-meaning people who will say, you inspire me because after you fell, you got back up again. And I'm like, that ain't the way it went down, man, okay? I mean, I, Peter denied Jesus three times. I denied him a thousand times. Uh, I let go of God more times than I can count. I'm here today and saying what I'm saying because he never let go of me. Not because I had the strength to not let go of him. Um, I mean, uh, our love does not endure forever. Peter's didn't, ours didn't. Ours doesn't. Well, fast forward to John chapter 21, okay? I'm going to, you can, I highly recommend, by the way, investing in a Bible. <clears throat> John 21, 
I just want to read three verses, verses 15 through 17. Okay, this is after Jesus dies. He's resurrected now. uh, And there are 40 days between Jesus' resurrection and his ascension back to the Father. Okay, his ascension back to heaven. And uh, in verses 15... Uh, the disciples come back from fishing early one morning and the resurrected Jesus is waiting for them on the beach and he's cooking breakfast for them. Um, And verse 15 says, uh, I I think I need those glasses again. You know, I was very confident in my eyesight, but I'm I'm showing that I can't be. Um, Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, well, feed my lambs. Then he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And Peter said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Beautiful. Jesus' response to Peter's failure is to commission him. Okay, just beautiful. Um, What a grueling experience that must have been for Peter, though. It's almost like Jesus is rubbing Peter's failure in his face, putting salt in the wound, you know? Um, He asks him three times to match, almost like a cruel reminder that he denied Jesus three times just a month earlier. And so Jesus asks him three times, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Um, And notice that Jesus recommissions Peter three times showing that Jesus' forgiveness matches and ultimately overpowers our failures. Okay? In fact, his love is so great that he even fits our failures into his future for us. Okay, That's mind-blowing. Um, notice, it was only after Peter failed that Jesus says, feed my sheep. I don't know where we get this idea that in order to be useful to God, we have to be good, clean, strong, and competent. And we don't see that anywhere, uh, anywhere in the Bible. Notice, never once did Jesus look around the room for the best example of holy living and send that person out to tell others about him. Never. He always sent stumblers and sinners. Always. Always. Now, I don't know about you, but I find that remarkably encouraging, okay? Um, <clears throat> we have this mistaken notion that strength and success is what makes us effective. Not according to the Bible, not in God's economy. This is just one of many stories in the Bible that show that no one is more qualified to speak of the significance of sin and the grandeur of grace like the one who has been there and done that. Recovery places have figured out that the best people to reach those who have bottomed out are those who have bottomed out themselves. I think the church has a lot to learn in that regard, to be honest with you. Um, I mean, who better to speak of God's redeeming grace than prodigals who once lived in the pigsty? Who know what it smells like, who know what it tastes like. Um, A lot of the guys that I've spent time with at Rock Recovery, for instance, the recovery place in West Palm Beach, in my opinion, are more self-aware and understand the seriousness of sin and the greatness of grace more than most pastors I know. Okay? I mean, that's the truth. I mean, I hate to sort of burst your bubble, but that is the truth. I mean, I've sat in rooms with pastors, and I've sat in rooms with recovering drug addicts. And I'm telling you right now, there is a, an awareness of weakness and sin and a dire awareness of needing God's grace over here that is oftentimes non-existent over here. Um, 
You see, the truth is, listen to me, the truth is that opening up about your struggles helps people so much more than talking about your strengths, okay? Way more. I mean, people may be somewhat inspired when you share your successes with them, but they connect with you and they feel less alone when you share your failures with them. And that's not just my opinion. I mean, we see that here in this story and we see it all throughout the Bible in a thousand different ways. It's our failures, not our successes, where God's grace shines the brightest through us into the lives of other people. I mean, after all, Paul said in Corinthians that it is in our weakness that God showcases his strength. That the sufficiency of God's grace in our lives is demonstrated not because we are mighty and capable, but primarily because we are not mighty and we're incapable. Then God gets the glory. Then God is showcased. His strength, his grace, his mercy is showcased. It's in our weakness that we discover God's strength. It's in our guilt that we discover God's grace. It's in our failure that we discover God's faithfulness. And it's in our failure that other people discover God's faithfulness. It's in our our guilt that other people find and discover God's grace too. Um, I said a few weeks ago that if our understanding of Christianity does not have room for the fact that our greatest failure may be in front of us, then scrap it. Okay, it's kind of a sobering, scary thing to say, and yet it's true. Um, And the reason I bring that up now is because Peter, in the story we just looked at, you know, confidence in his own love for God, that's going to carry the day. It gets proven to be, his love for God gets proven to be a lot weaker than he thought. He actually denies Jesus three times, denies even knowing Jesus, takes an oath saying, I don't even know the man, okay? I mean, those are some hardcore denials. And Jesus' response to that is to remind Peter that he loves him and then commissions Peter. He says, now, now you actually have something to say. Now you do. Now you don't, you're not confident in your love for me anymore. That's actually what was preventing you from being effective. Now you're confident in my love for you. Now you have something to say. Now you have food to give my sheep. So go give it. Go out there and talk about your badness and my goodness. Don't go out there talking about your goodness and strength. That's not what I want you to do. I want you to go out there and talk about how you failed and how I succeeded for you. That's what, that's, those are the words of life. So now Peter does it. And you read, you know, you read various portions of the book of Acts and Peter's instrumental in getting the early church started and off the ground. And, um, I mean, he's, he's a big part of God's plan in getting us to where we are right now. So here's a guy who failed, God forgave him, commissioned him, and you think, okay, he'll never fail again. Not true. You fast forward to Galatians, and the apostle Paul had to confront Peter there because Peter was denying Jesus all over again, all over again, making the same mistake in a different way. There was a rift developing between Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. And Jewish Christians back in those days thought that if Gentiles really wanted to be in the club, there were certain Jewish rituals they had to follow and things they had to do. And Peter, suffering from the peer pressure of these Jewish Christians, refused to associate with the Gentile Christians, refused to associate with them. And so Paul comes to Galatians, sees this going on. And he says, what are you doing? Like, you're denying the sufficiency of Jesus and everything he did all over again. I mean, you're, you're basically agreeing with the Jewish Christians who are saying Gentile Christians don't belong unless they jump through certain hoops. But you know that's not what Jesus, that which, that's not what Jesus is all about. That's not what the gospel is all about. So why are you denying his work again? Now, I know this sounds kind of sick, but that story encourages me. <laughs> Because here's a guy who failed, was forgiven, and failed again in the exact same way. 
thinking, okay, once someone really blows it, if you really, really screw up and you really blow it, you know, God's given you a second chance, but if you blow it again, <laughs> I mean, that's it for you. Yeah, I mean, that's it. You've reached the ceiling of God's forgiveness. I mean, I, it, God, it took God a lot of patience to forgive you this time. And he's being incredibly gracious by giving you another shot. But if you do that again, it's lights out for you, buddy. Okay? That's not the way God's love operates. It's not the way God's love works. Peter follows the exact same pattern again. Paul calling him out. He essentially denied Jesus again, which... <laughs> I'm not encouraging you guys to go out and repeat the same mistakes you've made, but know this, that when you do repeat the same mistakes you've made, and you do every day, okay, just ask your spouse if you're married or those closest to you, you repeat the same mistakes every day. Uh, and when you do, God does not reject you. He doesn't abandon you. He doesn't bail. He doesn't blink. Why? Because of Jesus. Because of what he's done for you. Um, I, I, I'm on a uh, close with this. I think it's appropriate. I read, I wrote this a while back, um, and I actually posted this last night. But I think this really kind of gets to the heart of how our love fails, but God's love succeeds. When I was 28, I believed I could change the world. At 48, I've come to the realization that I can't change much of anything, to say nothing of the world. I can't change my wife. I can't change my kids. I can't change any of you guys. I can't change anything, okay? Um, try as I might, I have not been able to manufacture outcomes the way I thought I could, either in my own life or other people's. Unfulfilled dreams, the loss of friendships, divorce, failure, the death of loved ones, remaining sinful patterns, whatever it is for you, live long enough, lose enough, suffer enough, and the idealism of youth fades, leaving behind the reality of life in a broken world as a broken person. Life has had a way of proving to me that I'm not on the constantly moving forward escalator of progress I thought I was on when I was 28. Instead, my life has looked more like this. Try and fail, fail than try, Try and succeed, succeed then fail. Two steps forward, one step back. One step forward, three steps back. Every year I get better at some things, worse at others. Some areas remain stubbornly static. To complicate matters even more, when I honestly acknowledge the ways I've gotten worse, it's actually a sign that I may be getting better. And when I become proud of the ways I've gotten better, it's actually a sign that I've gotten worse. And round and round we go. Now, if this sounds like a depressing sentiment, it isn't. Quite the opposite. If I'm grateful for anything about these past 20 years, it's for the way God has wrecked my idealism about myself and the world and replaced it with a realism about the extent of his grace and love, which is much bigger than I had ever imagined. That the smaller you get, the smaller life makes you, the easier it is to see the greatness of God's grace. Which is why, I've said this before, the Apostle Paul at the end of his life, he accomplished so much. I mean, he's up there, you know? It's like Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Apostle Paul. I mean, he's up there, okay? Um, he accomplished so much. I mean, he wrote half the New Testament. He's used by God to expand the reach of God's kingdom in the world of that day far and wide. And at the end of his life, after, I mean, this guy had been, this guy was a murderer of Christians, okay, early in his life. And then God confronts him, God rescues him, and God commissions him. He's always choosing the most unlikely candidates to do his work, always, okay? Um, and so God does that, and, and, and I mean, Paul meticulously walks with God. He's honest about his struggle with sin. He's, I mean, he talks about his thorn in the flesh. In Romans 7, he says, that the things I, I don't want to do, or I know I shouldn't do, I keep doing. And the things I know I should do, I don't do those things. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? I mean, he just goes on and on and on, talks honestly, realistically. 
about his sin and God's grace. And at the end of his life, this incredibly accomplished man at the end of his life says, I'm the chief of sinners. I'm the worst guy that I know. That's freedom to be able to say that. That's not depressing. That's honesty. That's not caring what other people think because you know you're in with God forever. I mean, when, when you know that God loves you, you don't need everybody else to like you. When you know that God accepts you, you don't need to be accepted by anybody else. I mean, when you know that God will never kick you out of his club, you don't need to constantly fight to get in other people's clubs, okay? I mean, it's, it's so liberating. And the only way that Paul could say something like that is if he believed with all of his heart that God loved him unconditionally based on what Jesus had done for him. So that he can say, I'm the chief of sinners. The closer you get to God, the more aware you become of your weakness and your sin. So when I say, like I did a few minutes ago, um, that the smaller you get, the smaller life makes you, the easier it is to see the greatness of grace. That's what I'm talking about. I mean, I was praying this morning. I was sitting on the couch praying this morning, thinking about Barry and Barb in particular and um, that whole situation, but then also thinking about you guys and praying for this morning and anybody else who would tune in online and just anybody who would eventually hear this message, praying for myself. And I was thinking in the course of my prayer, I just stopped and I was like, you know, God, you are, you're the best friend I've ever had. And I look back over 48 years and I, I see people come and people go, people who you thought would never show up, are on, they, they're there, and the people who you thought would always be there, they're gone. I mean, life is how I just described it. One step forward, three steps back, two steps forward, one step back. I mean, it's just, you know, life is hard. Um, it's topsy-turvy. It's got highs and lows. And at the end of the day, at the end of the day, he is always there. Always there. Never blinks. Never bails. Sometimes I wish he would make my life a little easier when it's hard. But even in those moments, I know that he loves me and he's allowing these things because he's doing something in me. He's doing something for me because he plans to do something with me. I trust him. Well, I don't trust him because I have some great faith. That trust that I have for him is a gift from God. He gives me that trust. Um... And so, while I am far more incapable than I may have initially thought, God is infinitely more capable than I had ever hoped. I mean, isn't it good news that our lives are ultimately dependent on the strength of His love for us rather than the strength of our love for Him? Man, I mean, that is good news. After all, it is His steadfast love that endures forever. Not ours, it's His it's his faithfulness that is great, not ours. And even when we are faithless, Peter tells us, he remains faithful. Isn't it interesting that Peter would say that? Of all people, of all people to say that, Peter, when we are faithless, he remains faithful. Let's pray.